Thank you very much, Nick. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, when I speak to libertarian societies, I always feel I should explain my, my job ties at King's Cross, being a lecturer in public policy. Someone doesn't really believe there should be very much in public policy. Um, but the way I look at it is that it's rather like being a lecturer in tropical diseases. Something that we need to understand in order to bring that to the right entirely So that's the way I like to think of my job title. Also, I don't tell people at King's. That's the way I see that as well. Maybe I should. Maybe they'll see this and find out. I'm in trouble. So today I'm going to yes, talk about um, the way that markets might solve social problems. I want to argue basically that there are, there are two types of social problems. The one I might call universal social, social problems that every society has to deal with. And there are another category of social problems that are socially constructed. And I want to argue that markets deal with both those types of problems. However, if we do let markets solve social problems, then quite a few things follow from that. Some of which we may not be so comfortable with. Some of which offer big challenges about the sort of outcomes that we see produced by markets. So the plan of the talk, we talk about first these two types of social problems. Secondly, talk about how markets might solve them. And thirdly, look at what follows from that. So the consequences, the outcomes that markets produce. So two distinct types of social problems. The first kind of social problem are universal to every advanced society. Firstly, we, every advanced society has to develop a framework for the rule of law and to protect private property rights. Secondly, every advanced society must resolve the problem of economic coordination. That is, they have to coordinate the activities of countless people dispersed over vast geographical differences in order to produce goods and services that people want at a reasonable level of, of efficiency. And that second, so second particular social problem is the one I'm going to talk about a little bit first. What we know is that human history is littered with societies that fail to solve the problem of economic coordination. And not least the communist regimes of um, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. These were all countries that didn't properly coordinate their economic activities, consequently suffered economic collapse, lots of misery, poverty, grave, grave problems. Now I believe that the, a market economy is the best way of solving the problem of economic coordination. Every day markets reconcile countless competing and diverse ends to produce, to, to simultaneously satisfy millions and millions of, of different competing demands. Now, there's a very, very good book, an interesting book by Paul Seabright, it's called The Company of Strangers. And in that book, as you may know those who've looked at the book, Seabright, I guess leaning quite heavily on Adam Smith, describes how an individual can walk into a shop in almost any city or town in the world and buy a shirt in the perfect size for them, or the right size, in a style that's acceptable and at a price that they can afford to pay. And know that that just doesn't happen once, but I think Seabright says that there are about 20 million shirts sold every day in the world. So 20 million times every day, that happens to somebody. Somebody walks into a shop, buys a shirt in the right size. And also that happens every single day, day after day, 20 million times a day this happens. And as Seabright sets out, this all happens without anybody being in charge. Nobody directs people to, to one place to buy their shirt, nobody tells people in advance they're going to buy a certain shirt, so on and so forth. And of course the key point is that if somebody did try to organise that, that, that would be simply impossible. complexity of the challenge would, would render it impossible to achieve. So the point being that the more complex a challenge is, the less meaningful it is to central direction. So very complex systems need to be organised spontaneously, or need to run in a spontaneous manner. I think it's widely accepted that markets achieve this, that markets solve the social problem. But I think what's less widely accepted, or less widely recognised, is exactly how markets do this. Now, it's often assumed that markets gain efficiency by the use of incentives. That if people, if you have, make costs visible and make people bear the cost of their actions, then people will operate at a high level of efficiency than if costs aren't visible and people don't bear the resulting costs. Now, there's certainly something in that, there's certainly some proof that incentives are important. But I think that's only a very partial account of how markets succeed and why markets are efficient. Indeed, 
you have to look at the private sector or private sector companies in any country, and what you see is that many private sector companies run at a loss for one period of time. Many private companies go bankrupt. So if simply existence of bottom lines was always needed to bring about efficiency, then that would be the case. But private sector organisations would always be in profit. Clearly that's not what happens. However, I think the point is that it's because private sector companies may go bankrupt that, um, that they operate to a high level, of, high level of efficiency. That is, if every private company that lost money was given more money by the government, say, then there would be no incentive or no reason for them to operate efficiently. So this brings us to the idea that the heart of a market economy is the idea of negative feedback. So the market can be understood as an enormous feedback mechanism that provides information about the success and failure of different enterprises, different ways of doing things, different uses of scarce resources. So, if one particular firm uses cheaper methods of production than its rivals, it's going to reap higher profits. And that provides feedback for that firm and for its competitors. Those that take note of that should also use similar cheaper methods, increase their, their efficiency, and thereby raise the overall standard. Also, producers who don't respond to the feedback they receive, producers who don't try to operate efficiently, they're going to go bankrupt. So if you don't respond to negative feedback, then there's a problem. The same thing happens clearly with salaries for jobs, working conditions, all these things are determined by the market on the basis of negative feedback. I think a key point here is that this information isn't known in advance to market participants. So the market then is first and foremost a discovery procedure. So if we did know in advance what was the most efficient use of our resources, there'd be no point in having a market process. Even if we didn't know what, what was the best or the appropriate wage for a particular job or the best working conditions, again there'd be no point in discovering this information. So as Hayek set out, the information that the market process generates is valuable only because, and so far as, its results are unpredictable and on the whole different from those anybody could have deliberately aimed at. So the market does provide competitive pressures that act as incentives. But that's only part of the story. More importantly, the market enables us to discover information. Information about the costs and benefits of different courses of action that we could not know in advance. I want to just say a quick word about coordination with a market economy, what I might mean by coordination. Coordination clearly doesn't mean that people work towards a common end in this context. On the contrary, many people, many firms will be active competitors. Two firms might be competing for the same consumers, two individuals might be competing for the same job. So again, coordination simply means that competing ends are reconciled, that somehow we dovetail together ends that might be ultimately in conflict. So hence, people's actions generate this dynamic, complex economic system. None of them intend this, none of them foresee this. So in the words of Hayek again, it's the result of, of human action but not human design. Now in the absence of this information, the absence of this negative feedback, people in a non-market economy have no capacity to discover the most efficient use of the resources at their disposal, nor the relative preferences of consumers for different goods and services. So just to, to reiterate, it's because the market enables the discovery of previously unknown and unknowable information that it solves this coordination problem faced by every advanced society. And all attempts to organise economies without use of market mechanisms, without use of prices, have ended in catastrophic failure. So that's the first kind of social problem, um, problem with, that every society faces, the problem of coordinating individual economic activity. Now imagine that accounts there, it was, it's familiar to most of you, I hope it is. Um, the point we want to bring out is the idea of, of uh, discovery. Because if we think about markets of discovery, 
that has implications for me trying to utilise markets to achieve other kind of goals and to solve other sorts of social problems. So the second type of social problem are those that we might say are socially constructed. <clears throat> These are phenomena whose problematic nature differs across time and space. I may be considered problematic in one society at one time, or in different societies at the same time. Now to say that a social problem is socially constructed doesn't imply it's not real or it's not important. Rather, it's to recognise the social nature of the processes by which such a problem is constructed. So we might say, for example, that poverty is a socially constructed problem. That is because what it means to be poor clearly differs across time and across space. No judgement about whether poverty is a real problem and so on is implied. So I think about Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. He wrote about that um, in England it was not considered to be um, respectable to go out in the street without a pair of clogs on. Whereas in Scotland it was still okay to walk about barefoot. I think clearly two things probably we should draw from that. Firstly, that things haven't changed very much. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, that there is a relative dimension to poverty. And there was something that was recognised by people like Adam Smith and so on. That it does matter that the social context of poverty is important, and absolute measures I think are not the only ones that we should, we should think about. Well, the question would be then how does the market respond to these sorts of problems, to things that are socially constructed? Well, I want to talk to, through now two examples. Um, one example is the problem of smoking in enclosed public places. And the second example I'll come to is education as a, in a broad sense. Well, smoking in enclosed public places, I think, is, is a classic example of a problem that's been socially constructed. I'm sure all of you are aware that for most of the 20th century, smoking in enclosed public places wasn't considered problematic at all. I mean, I'm still, I'm still, I am, old enough to remember a time when you could go into somebody's house and light up a cigarette without any sort of comment. It was just the done thing. You know, cinemas, you could smoke anywhere in a cinema, you could smoke on airplanes, so on and so forth. You know, smoking was okay everywhere. No one raised an eyebrow. But that's no longer the case. I think it's not the case for two reasons. Um, firstly, very obviously, is we now know more about the health risks associated with passive smoking. Again, there's pretty good <coughs> scientific evidence that passive smoking does have health uh, consequences. Although, whether those really exist in the workplace rather than in the home and long exposure is another question. But there are health risks associated with passive smoking or secondhand smoke. That's the first reason. The second reason is that those health risks have been publicised. So the public health lobby has gone out of its way to communicate very strongly these health risks to people. So people are now are very aware of them and said maybe that's a good thing. The consequence of all that then is that smoking in enclosed public places becomes something that is accepted and normal and then becomes a problem. <clears throat> well, in the language of economics, we would therefore call secondhand smoke or passive smoking an, an externality. It's of course clear that, that one group of people, smokers, pose on another group of people, non-smokers. And people encounter this externality both in, in a market context and in a political context. So in a market context we encounter secondhand smoke as the patrons or the owners even of bars and restaurants, and in a political context we encounter this problem as voters and perhaps politicians who make decisions about legislation and regulation. So how do the market solve the social problem of smoking in closed public places? <coughs> we know we have a framework to try to understand this, and that will be the work of Ronald Coase, obviously, on, on the problem of social cost. And Coase, in his famous work, argues that where property rights are clearly defined, and where transactions costs are zero, markets should externalise these sorts of externalities. I'm sure well, I could talk for a really quick example, but I'm actually it's not necessary. Um, the classic case would be a factory, or to say, a factory that produces £300 worth of pollution, say, so I'm going to say, to change the figures, a factory that produces £100 of pollution from a product that has £100 of benefit. Well, if you can have a compensation payment between 299 and 101 for 
from factory to neighbour who's polluted, then that internalises the externality. And that's a, a superior outcome than simply ceasing production. Ceasing production imposes high costs than internalising the externality. That would be a classic sort of coaching situation. Now, I must note that internalisation in a coaching model doesn't necessarily imply financial compensation. It simply means some sort of agreement to remove or ameliorate the externality. So again, so if a, a factory pollutes a river, it doesn't have to pay the neighbour's money to, to clean it up. It could clean it up itself, or it could restore it to a good condition. Or it could compensate them by building a school or something. It could do something else. As long as people are happy with the outcome, then that's fine. The externality is being internalised yeah, in a coaching model. Now, when, as the problem of secondhand smoke became more widely known, a number of scholars did um, propose or theorise that the Coastal model should apply in this case. That as long as we have clearly defined property rights, as long as transaction costs are quite low, that private markets should internalise the externality caused by secondhand smoke. What's quite surprising, I think, is how very few studies have been done trying to explore this. As far as I'm aware, there have only ever been four studies to try and explore this, all in America, all involving um, one guy called Marlowe, he's, he's John Marlowe, yeah, John Marlowe. <coughs> three of those studies, it should be noted, were funded by the tobacco industry, um, and therefore the rubbish by many people. But all the studies have been published in peer-reviewed journals in, in economics, so there is some scholarly weight to them. But what um, Marlowe and his two colleagues found or argued was if you look at private markets where there are problems with second-hand smoke in bars and restaurants, we see quite good evidence of internalisation along the lines that Coase would, would predict. So the, the one study they did not funded by the tobacco industry was in the Californian town of San Luis Obispo, that's pronounced correctly, which was famous now for the first town to ban um, smoking in closed public places. And their study of bars and restaurants there, quite a straightforward study done by their students, found that the majority of bars and restaurants had clear provision for smokers and non-smokers. They had separate smoking areas, separate non-smoking areas. And when they talked to the patrons of the restaurants, nobody expressed high levels of dissatisfaction. The people went to those bars and restaurants were happy with what they found there. Similarly, they did a, a much larger study, um, a national survey of about a thousand bars and restaurants across America. And again, they found similarly a plurality of different arrangements. I think there's a very small number of bars that are completely banned smoking, very small, a bigger number, but small number that allow smoking throughout the premises. And the vast majority of bars and restaurants had separate smoking and non smoking areas. And that was found similarly in the other two studies, which are both studies in uh, Wisconsin. So, what we find in a sense is a diversity of responses. What we find is the market provides a small number of non smoking establishments, a small number of wholly smoking establishments and then this big middle ground of some form of separation. Now, without going into too much detail there, because it's not really appropriate, what they also found was that the, the different responses of bars and restaurants were correlated to what we might call business factors. So a bar close to um, a residential area, say, lots of, with lots of families, where there might be, say, children or, or parents of children going there, they were likely to have much bigger non-smoking areas. Whereas uh, bars and restaurants by universities where they had lots of young people, again, they had much smaller uh, non-smoking provision. And that was predicted by, by the, yeah, that supported their basic, uh, uh, basic prediction that the arrangements would respond to consumer demand. That consumer demand was driving this more than anything else. <clears throat> so as I said, so this improvement would seem to support a coercive position that you have self-interested bar and restaurant, so restaurant owners who, are, who have clearly, who clearly own the property rights and they assign different parts of their premises to smokers and non-smokers. And clearly the two, the two receipts at the end of each working day, they provide the negative feedback. So if they get the provision wrong, they won't get enough customers and their competitors will benefit. <coughs> they've got a, a self-interested desire to meet people's preferences, to meet people's needs. I guess the final point to make here is that as the social acceptability of smoking has declined, 
we can expect to see, in a market situation, greater and greater provision for non-smokers. Indeed, you know, if the trends about passive smoking continue, there's no reason to suppose that a market eventually wouldn't provide just wholly non-smoking premises, bar and rest bars and restaurants. I think you may be aware that Weatherspoons, the, um, the pub chain, were about to go entirely non-smoking uh, shortly before the smoking ban was introduced in this country. And in a sort of competitive market situation, that could have moved us towards, you know, not wholly, but, but certainly a much higher proportion of non-smoking bars and restaurants uh, in this country. to the response of political actors to uh, the problem of smoking in close public places. Well, as we know, this response has been quite different. Uh, basically, it's taken the form of, of smoking bans introduced in almost every uh, developed country. Uh, the first one in California in 1998, then in New York in 2001, and now pretty much every European country, um, most American states, most Canadian provinces, I think Australia, uh, New Zealand, Japan, Hong Kong, all these places have effectively banned smoking in closed public places. Now the basis for that type of response is that smoking in bars and restaurants constitutes a market failure. So it's argued that the ultimate, ultimate solution has to be the complete removal of this negative externality. However, there's no reason to really believe that that's true. I, I'm not aware of any published paper that makes you know, in economic terms, the case for a market failure in the pre-smoking ban situation in bars and restaurants. Uh, the only evidence that's been supported, put forward for that view, is one paper suggesting that um, restaurant profits and bar profits have decreased in California after the smoking ban there. But again, I think that evidence was on a very short time scale, I think about three years. And I think now that the situation might have been the same in California, but certainly in this country it isn't the case. That Profits of, of pubs have fallen dramatically uh, post smoking ban, and as we know, many pubs have closed. What I think is more likely is that smoking ban affect the preferences of a minority of people. The people who basically would refuse to go into a pub or restaurant unless there's absolutely no smoking in there. And all the evidence that I'm aware of suggests that that's, that's a minority of the population. I think it also reflects the preferences of elite political actors. For various reasons, politicians like to be seen to be doing something, and banning smoking is something they can, they can be seen to do. So what we see then in the case of smoking in closed public places is two different solutions to a social problem. Market processes then involve the discovery of a range of accommodations, a range of different things, between non-smoking and smoking patrons of bars and restaurants. And clearly that outcome won't satisfy some people. The smoking ban, on the other hand, imposes what if you like, all or often exclusive solution on the whole situation. One thing that might follow from this then is that if we wish to achieve a policy outcome, say policy outcome X, in this case the prohibition of smoking in enclosed public places, there's no reason to believe that the markets will produce that solution. You know, whatever our preferred solution will be, there's no reason to believe markets will produce it. <coughs> Rather, markets will produce an outcome that reflects the subjective, diverse, and if you like, tacit preferences of individual market participants and the trade-offs that they choose to make. In this case, as I seem to internalise these externalities caused by this social problem. So that's the first um, social problem. Let me say a few words then about the second one, which is quite a different one, which is education. Well, in some respects, education, I suppose, is a universal social problem. And as every society has to socialise its young people and impart to them skills and knowledge that they think they might require. But I think what knowledge should be communicated, how it should be communicated, how the education should be provided, is clearly context dependent. So when politicians, for example, welcome gains in literacy and numeracy, or disparate declines in literacy and numeracy, we're seeing there the social construction of education, or the social construction of education as a social problem. <coughs> well, whereas in the case of the
smoking ban, we can look at a market-based solution and a non-market-based solution. I think in education we can't really do that. I, I don't think we know what a non-market education system might look like. I think we know what a state education system looks like. And that's what we have in this society at the moment. But clearly when 93% of people are educated in the state system, it's very hard for the market to develop in any sort of meaningful or independent way. And there have been examples, which you may be aware, of private schools that have been quite innovative. Um, Dartington School, or Dartington Hall School, should I say, in Devon, it's quite a famous example. Uh, where a number of famous um, people went there, Lucy Freud went to Dartington School, for example, and a few, a few musicians went there. Um, but it closed down in the 80s, largely because of controversies about drug taking and uh, promiscuity amongst the pupils. So, Maybe it's not a great example of, of uh, market-based education. <laughs> what I think we can perhaps do is imagine what a market in education might look like. And there was one book published by the Institute of Economic Affairs uh, five years ago now called Toward Liberal Utopia, which is a very, very good book in which about 15 authors <coughs> talked about how things might be 50 years in the future in their particular area of expertise. And one of the chaps in that book was by a man called James Tooley, who some of you may know at Newcastle University. And Tooley imagined what a liberal utopia in education might look like. By imagining what it would be like to wake up 50 years in the future when the state was no longer involved in education. And in Tooley's chapter, he described a future in which learning takes place throughout society. So in family homes, in workplaces, sports centres, town halls, reading rooms and pubs, bookstores and so on. Schools, as we recognise them, would, would no longer exist. In fact, he wrote, people looked back on our obsession with schooling with a mixture of horror and bewilderment. <laughs> so rather we had a future with a polarity of some philanthropic, philanthropic some for profit education providers providing a plurality of different education, educational experiences, again, tailored to meet a whole range of different needs. And I think, again, I might add that Tooley, I think, is a really great writer on the distinction between schooling and learning. I think so often we confuse going to school with actually learning, and I'm certainly pretty confident that they're, they're entirely different things. I guess part of the point would be that Tooley's vision is just one possible future. You know, there must be infinite possible futures that could develop a market-based education system. Um, we could have one that would look entirely like tool efficient without schools, with like what we might call a de-school society, or one that looks quite similar to what we have today. Again, we've got a way of knowing. Again, the point would be that the market is a discovery procedure in which you might discover what people will actually want, given the choice. I think what is clear though is that the sort of process that tool they described and the sort of future that arises from that process. It's completely incompatible with a national curriculum, uh, you know, the monolithic provision by the state. It really requires innovation, pluralism, and, and feedback. So hopefully these two examples demonstrate that there's a clear difference between the way that markets solve social problems and the way that governments solve social problems. As I said. The, the market produces outcomes that we don't necessarily anticipate, whereas the uh, government solution produces outcomes that fit the preferences of political leaders on the whole. So, I think what follows from all this is that if we accept, or were to accept, a market-based solution to social problems, then that implies accepting that we don't know the correct solutions. It implies accepting, in a sense, some sort of leap in the dark. So, to give another example, a, a parallel example, I suppose, if we think of the provision of food by supermarkets, so the provision of food by the markets, I would argue that we can't guarantee that tomorrow or at some point in the future, supermarkets will always provide food. In a sense, there, there could be reasons why that might not happen. In the same sense, if the market were always to provide education, we couldn't guarantee that education would always be provided. That makes sense. I think we can't say for definite that it would always happen. That's, that's good, that's a leap that. I think what well, the point is, we have to have faith in the market. I mean, it's, it's a leap of faith is what I'm getting at. I mean, I do believe it would always happen, but I think we cannot prove, if you like, in a sort of evidential sense, that it would always happen. I think there's an element of faith in that. 
So we have to have faith in a sense in people's ability to make the right choices. And this brings us to the question, I think, which is perhaps the key question, as to whether we should have faith in people's ability to make well-being enhancing choices in the marketplace. Now I imagine many of you have come across recent evidence from behavioural economics and behavioural law economics suggesting that people will not always make welfare enhancing choices in the marketplace. And this sort of viewpoint has received a lot of attention from, by the book uh, Nudge by Taylor, Baylor and Sustain. And the central conceit of this, of this approach is that because of basic cognitive biases, people don't always make welfare enhancing choices. And one example that Taylor and Sunston talk about is a cafeteria in a school. And depending on how the food is arranged in the cafeteria, people will either make healthy choices or unhealthy choices. So if the healthy options are put in place A, they'll be chosen. If the unhealthy options are put in place A, they'll be chosen. So the argument is that is the, the, the second choice for people chosen healthily is welfare reducing. What's said to follow from this then is that we shouldn't necessarily have very much faith in people's ability to make the right choices. Unless, as I can, we get the choice architecture, to use the phrase, unless we get the choice architecture correct. And in particular, it's not only that the people, um, in a broad sense, don't make the right choices, but people make choices that are not, in, not compatible with their own interests. So people make choices that are contrary to their own interests, and in particular, they're sort of stated preferences. So some people say, I want to lose weight or eat more healthily, and then they consistently make the wrong choice, or make the choice contrary to that particular preference. And I think the, the, the nudge and approach, and, and the nudge book, and the work in behavioural economics, certainly has some important insights, and I think it's worth reflecting on many of the examples that, that are discussed therein. But I think it also raises some important concerns. Firstly, clearly, it assumes that a group of people, perhaps a class of people, I'm not sure really, but a certain group of individuals, do know what's best for other people in a wide range of contexts. Now it's possible to think of instances where that clearly would be the case. So clearly it's not a good thing to drive a car without brakes or to stand on the top of a tall building without some sort of safety mechanism. Clearly those things could well be welfare reducing. But there are so many more cases where I think the evidence is much less clear cut. Uh, one example that springs to my mind is car seat belts. I don't know if people know the evidence about car seat belts, but what's certainly true is if you're in a car accident, if you're in a car, you really ought to be wearing a seat belt. A seat belt. So if you're in a car crash, the seat belts really are, 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 are essential. However, what we also know is that when you force people to wear seat belts, they drive more uh, dangerously, more riskily, and you have a higher rate of accidents. And there's some really compelling evidence of this from Australia. Some of you may be aware. Australia introduced car seatbelts state by state in the 1970s, I think from about 71 to 79, they introduced it state by state. And what you see is the compulsory seatbelt legislation is, 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 is enacted, is the death rate on the roads increases state by state. And the evidence is rock solid for every country that's ever introduced that sort of legislation, that it always increases the death toll on the roads. Now why should that be the case? Well, I hope it's obvious that, that again, it's the transference of the problem, if you like, or the danger from car drivers and pedestrians, car drivers and passengers to pedestrians and cyclists. So car drivers drive more riskily, they don't die necessarily while they get seriously injured, but with the pedestrians that they hit and the cyclists that they hit, they pay the toll. So they're the people, their death rate increases dramatically, whereas the death rate for car drivers and passengers decreases. But the point of being nudged in terms of clearly what's the nudge? Is the nudge to wear your seatbelt? which if, if you're a car driver is a wise thing to do, or is a nudge not to, not to wear the seatbelt, drive more safe and not kill some cyclist or some pedestrian? Um, I don't know what the nudge is, obviously that's the point. Um, it's impossible to say, I think. <clears throat> um, another example might be the way that consumers use resources um, in markets. Um, okay, you can pick so many cases, mobile phones or MP3 players will Good examples. Situations where people have spent millions of pounds, literally millions of pounds, in, in the case of mobile phones, on technology, on consumer devices in a sense. Now, if we were to go back to the time just before mobile phones were put on the marketplace and we were told we could spend, let's say, 10 million pounds on mobile phones 
in the next 10 years. Or we could spend it on educational healthcare. Would we really want people to spend that money on mobile phones? Or MP3 players, whatever it might be. I think clearly if we're going to be libertarian paternalists, we're surely going to say no. Come on, it's educational healthcare or something else. That seems to be to follow, maybe it doesn't. That seems to be to follow. Um, the point being clear that, that, again, if we're going to get, give people freedom in markets, we're going to make choices that might be problematic. We're going to make choices that we might not wish them to make. In a sense in which, you know, I'd rather people spend money in education, come to King's College and do a degree from the policy, rather than buy an every free player. And <laughs> yeah. clearly, clearly not enough people think that. <laughs> Actually, it's too many at the moment, but there's a story at the end. The second point, uh, and I say it's the final major point really, which is the nature of the protest, process by which these sort of alternative nudges might be arrived at. And this is one of the problems, I think, of, of the, the nudge approach, is that it assumes that political decision making is, I wouldn't say perfect, but say, uh, free from sort of cognitive bias. And again, that, that's, that's really preposterous. Certainly anybody with knowledge of public choice would know that simply isn't the case. Um, I'll quickly run through, I think I've got seven uh, biases of the political process, I'll, I'll quickly go through them. I'm sure they're familiar to most people. Um, one problem clearly is that political choices tend to be exclusive. That is, we get an all or nothing choice. Um, some choices are exclusive, obviously you can build a bridge or not build a bridge, you can't have half a bridge, unless you not uh, not to building bridges. Um, but other choices clearly should necessarily be all or nothing. So, you know, an example mentioned in the literature sometimes is, is nuclear deterrence. Again, the 10 to be is an all or nothing choice. Do we want a nuclear deterrent or not? Again, in many respects, the choice might be how much of a deterrent we want. Do we want five missiles or 10 or 100 or 200? That's relevant in the cost terms because these things are so expensive. What we tend to get is an all or nothing choice. We tend to get either how many nuclear deterrents, so we have 200 Trident missiles, or we don't have one. Why not just have 10 or 50 or whatever? What we really want is a continuum of possibility. But the political process doesn't really offer that sort of choice, it seems. It's, it, Turn this thing into all or nothing exclusive choices. We're out about smoking ban. Either we have smoking pubs or we don't have it. The second and I guess the most celebrated problem with um, political decision making is simply the fact that voting, a single vote has such a, a minuscule influence on the outcome of any election. I guess you know the figures and the book by Kaplan has been very influential in for the, the rational voter. But Kaplan's argument, as we know, is that uh, the general public choice case is that because um, each vote has so little impact, people <coughs> don't vote very cleverly. They don't put much attention on much time into deciding how to vote. And for classical public choice, that creates a problem of rational ignorance. People again vote on the basis of this information. For Kaplan, it creates a problem of bias in a sense. People vote on the basis of, of, of the worst possible cognitive behaviour. They just think about, you know. Obama looks like a nice, nice man until the black president. Let's vote for Obama. They don't really think care about his policies. And when they do, it seems, as in Massachusetts, they then decide they don't want them after all. <laughs> <laughs> and that's two. So, third, third sort of problem with this decision making is the idea of uncertainty. So, clearly, if we buy something in the marketplace, we know we're going to get it on the whole. So, if you buy an MP3 player, you will see an MP3 player. If you vote for something in a political context, you don't necessarily get what you vote for. You get what, what everybody else votes for. And that clearly influences the way that we act in political context. Because if you're not sure we're going to get something, maybe we shouldn't vote for it. Maybe we should vote for the second best choice. <coughs> the second dimension to um, the, the, the problem of um, uncertainty is problem of time. Now, as an individual, one might save one's resources for the future. The problem in a political context is that if I vote to save my resources for the future, what might just happen is somebody else will spend them, even now in the future. So if, if there's some choice on offer that on the balance I wouldn't really have, I'd rather not build a new hospital right now because I'd rather have a bridge built perhaps in 10 years' time. The problem is that if that did happen in 10 years' time, people might choose to build something entirely different that I don't want at all. So therefore, in the, in the short term, it might make sense to go for the hospital. 
So that would be the, in a political context, again, it, it works against safety, it works against long term, long -term choices. Um, the fifth pathology, if you like, of democratic decision making is that choices tend to be uncosted. Okay, very simply, most political choices, when they, they're, they're given to us, don't have direct costs attached. And if the costs are attached, they tend to be big, bulky costs, like billions of pounds for a whole policy platform, rather than simple costs for simple products. And that links in with the idea of bundling. So again, most political choices, have, yes, most political choices let's say, are bundled together. You have to vote for Labour and all their policies, or Conservatives and all their policies, but really our preferences are much more subtle than that. And then this, I mean, my type, that clearly bundling also happens in the marketplace. As it's often said, you can't buy the Times without the sports section, um, therefore you have to pay for the sports section. <laughs> and that's, of course, it's a truism. However, clearly the bundles in the marketplace are much smaller. In a, in a political context, you've got the one big, huge bundle with your know, idiots cross, whereas in, in, in a market context, you're able to select your own basket of goods to a certain extent. And then finally, this, the seventh factor is simply that the market, or sorry, political processes don't necessarily take into account intensity of preference. So if we have, say, a vote on a planning, de plan planning decision to build a, a factory right next door to my house, my one vote counts the same as the vote of people living five miles away. Yet for me, clearly, that's a very important decision, may influence my life in a big way. For those people, it's less important. But again, one vote carries equal weight, one person, one vote. But on different decisions, people clearly will feel differently. They have a very different intensity of preference. So, what I'm arguing today then to conclude is that markets can and do and should solve social problems. However, if we're going to use markets to solve social problems, it means accepting that we can't impose predetermined outcomes upon people. It means accepting, therefore, that people will make choices that we might not necessarily like. Clearly, for many people, we have a fixed view of what's the best possible outcomes for society, let's say. That's going to be difficult to accept. Indeed, for many people, we we'll acquire a completely different worldview. A view where we put faith in people and allow them to make their own choices. However, I guess I would argue, and this may be is the starting point as well as the finishing point, is that how much we may despite the choices that people make, I think it's morally wrong to impose our own preferences on them. We have to have faith in people and their choices.